see and we're live it's amazing isn't it techniques it never lets you down until it does <laughs> welcome to another episode of the digital classroom maybe we're gonna change the name digital to analog because that always works okay so are you ready guys we are so let's start another episode of digital classroom there we go Okay, hey guys, welcome in our studio in Emmeloord, but this time not our photo studio, it's more the studio we have at home. Now, I think one of the most asked questions about the digital workflow is actually like, how do you connect everything together? And of course, normally during Digital Classroom, we do photo shoots with models, or we do retouching sessions, or we do something else. And today, that's one of those episodes where we do something else. Now, I think two or three years ago i started with the idea like wouldn't it be awesome like apple now has this amazing ipad pro wouldn't it be great to in integrate something pro into a workflow that's pro yeah well let me put it this way if you have an ipad nowadays with an m1 chipset or with an apple pencil you have one of the most amazing devices in the world of course uh, listen to apple it's the best this it's the best that the only problem is is it really a pro device if you can't run a full photoshop that was the first question i asked myself is it a full pro device if i can't shoot tethered with a cable and actually on most of those questions i had to say no because i couldn't shoot tethered with a cable i could shoot tethered wireless and in all honesty in most cases it worked uh, we did some tests with for example the kenfi which worked awesome on my sony so i can highly recommend the kenfi for that and also the stability of the kenfi was absolutely great however there were situations where we came where the batteries died or where there was so much interference from wi-fi that the wireless transfer it just didn't work great or actually it didn't work at all of course you're shooting jpegs right because raw files over the air doesn't really work so it's always this this part of where you go like i would love to do raw files because then i can show edits to what is visible so at one point i just said you know what we're gonna use cables and that was the moment where the ipad pro actually stopped working for me because you can't shoot tethered with a cable <laughs> In March this year, uh, Cascable, an app which I'm using, and I'm going to show you that in a moment. We're going to show you everything, so stay connected. Um, Cascable came out with an update, and with that update, it's now available also for Sony cameras. So now I can, with my Sony, can shoot tethered with a cable to Cascable. That's a tongue breaker. And I have to be honest, guys, this really changed the whole way of how I work because this is without any doubt absolutely awesome. The transfers are mega fast. It's, of course, an iPad, so you have all day battery. You have a very, very bright screen. And one of the most important things, it's very easy to mount on a stand an iPad Pro. Today, what I'm going to do is it's going to be a shorter episode. It's not going to be two hours for the very simple reason. I don't know how in the world i can do two hours with this so i'm going to keep it short i'm going to keep it very very simple so everybody can understand if it goes too fast just rewind so we're going to dedicate this into several blocks the first block i want to do is on location so we're now going out well, we're not really going out but we're now going out and we go on location what do we need the first thing of course and that's the duh issue you need a camera right you need an ipad and that's actually all and you need a cable of course but there's more if we look at our cameras we use so-called usb ports now those usb ports can be very good like for example usb c but they can also be very fragile like usb mini or usb micro so we have to make sure that if we shoot on location and we shoot with a cable we have to make sure that we protect our port now there are many ways to protect your port i'm going to show you what we use now, you already see the cap IQ Wire. That's the brand we're promoting and the brand we're using. And we are also the distributor of IQ Wire. So there's a reason I'm using this. And I'm going to tell you that right away. If you look at my camera, do you see how neat this looks? Now, the angled connectors are not just there because it looks neat. It does look neat, right? It looks. Look at this. Isn't that just awesome? I just love that. But it looks neat. 
but there's something else. If you use a straight cable and your camera falls over, you will get a lot of stress on your port and there's a big chance that your port will actually break down. Plus, it just doesn't look nice, right? It's just a whole, it doesn't look nice. But it, there's of course something else. If you look very closely at my camera, you see that it walks all the way down under here. And this is our cable block. This is my own brand. So this is something I had a lot of frustration with other cable blocks or other solutions. And at one point I just said, you know what, we're going to pick something that's very close and we're going to change some things over. The first thing we did change was, of course, the color. We need bright red. Now you might wonder, bright red, is it just because it's bright red? No, because you can literally see it very easy in your bag and you can see it in a dark studio. So black, you don't see that easily. So red and it looks cool. The other thing is it's a little bit smaller than the other solutions for the very simple reason. You can now open up your battery case if you have one, of course, in this case, I'm using a grip, but also you don't hurt your hands if you have a smaller camera and especially those larger ones, even on the Sony, they came all the way to the edge and then sometimes you just went with your hand over. The shorter ones are way better. Another thing that we changed, which I absolutely love, especially on location, if you don't need a coin. So we have this little handle. And that way you can easily take the cable block, as we call it, take it off and put it on. And of course, it's ARCA mount compatible. So if you're on location and you need to fasten your cable, use something like this. Now, in our case, we highly promote this, as we in the Netherlands say, wij van WC eend promote WC eend. In English, that doesn't really translate. It's something like we say it's good because it's from us. And that's a little bit of an inside joke, but I really mean it. This is an awesome solution. And because we designed it ourselves, well, we didn't really design it ourselves, it's a standard design, but we changed it ourselves, we gave it our color, we label it under our own brand. And one of the things that I found incredibly important, it has to be affordable. So this solution, 35 euros, available in shops in the Benelux, or we can send it worldwide. So that's the first part. We now have our camera nicely protected. So the port is nicely protected it looks nice we can put it on a stand but where does the cable go well the cable of course goes into the ipad pro and into the ipad pro or into the ipad pro via it's via let me first switch over to the screen from the ipad pro so let's switch over just for a second okay there we go okay so this is cash cable now this is a software that i use on location but how do we connect that camera towards your iPad, right? You can, of course, on location, just plug it in straight into the USB-C connector. But we also use the iPad, for example, with demos, trade shows, and whatnot more. So we need something more. We also need HDMI. Sometimes we need a card reader. Sometimes we need USB-A. Sometimes we need also to charge our iPad. So what we did is we bought something. I'm going to take a picture of it. That's the cool thing about a shooting tethered at the moment. Okay, there we go. So this is one of the hubs that we use. Now you can buy them for 25 euros, for 30 euros. This one is 70 euros. And for the very simple reason, this one also supports charging your iPad. So as you can see here, I'm now using one HDMI and one USB-C. But next to that USB-C, there's another USB-C and that also supports charging. When you buy something like this for yourself, make sure, make absolutely sure that you get one that also supports charging. And this also works for, uh, for example, MacBooks. If you work in a studio and on location, you just use one of those. You connect everything to the hub. I'm using an OVC in the studio. That's a much larger device. You then take that on location. So you connect everything to that device and then you put one cable into your uh, MacBook Pro or your iPad. <laughs> Funny story about that. You're going to see that in a moment. I'm also recording music in the area where I'm now. You see the guitars behind me. And one of the problems, and maybe you guys experienced this too, was this annoying, like really annoying high whistle tone in my audio. And for the love of it, I couldn't get it out. Whatever I tried, always that annoying whistle. The weird thing is, as soon as I took out my USB-C, it was gone. But then I also didn't have any sound on the table. So in other words, yeah. However, if I also took out my power connector, everything was fine, no whistle. That's weird, right? A MacBook Pro designed for music, why does it whistle in your music? 
The thing was, as soon as we started using external docks and only one cable to the laptop, all the whistling was gone and the noise floor became really, really low. So if you're like me also editing music, editing video, make sure that you use an external dock with charging because that whistle is so annoying. Every time you move the cursor, you hear that sound like a hard drive and there's no hard drive in there. The weird thing is I had the same thing with the Dell laptop, same solution, external, and it worked. So that's why we actually started using external also on the MacBook. Okay, so we use that external device. That's step one, but you only need that in the, uh, in the studio. Now you might wonder like, hey Frank, but how is it with speed? Like, is it really that fast? Okay, here we have a Sony A7R 4 It doesn't charge over USB at the moment. That's also possible with our cables. It is connected straight to the iPad Pro and I have no limitations on the camera so in other words i'm not shooting jpeg i'm shooting pure raw files what's the speed and i'm gonna move the camera otherwise you won't see it yeah talk about fast the cool thing is that with our cables we keep this up the whole shoot and it's very very stable so it's about 10 15 percent faster than any other cables on the market and it's very, very stable. And that's because in our cables we use IntelliConnect. Now I'm not gonna talk too much about the cables, but I wanna make it complete that you guys know why I choose something or why I don't choose something else. And the other reason for the IQ wire cables, and this is the most important part. Let me just put the camera down so you guys can see. The most important part isn't really that it works fast, but it's this. Yep. Yep. Let's go. Let's continue. Yeah. How long do you still have? Do you still have some time? Yes, of course. Yeah, we still have some time. Almost there. <laughs> this is a 10 meter cable. Now, how can you make 10 meter cables on location to work? Very simple. On the 10 meter cables, you find a booster. In every 10 meter cable, we have two boosters and they will give you some power to the camera from the laptop or the iPad Pro, so you don't need any extra power supplies. And it also makes sure that that whole connection in 10 meters is stable. Hey Frank, it's about location work. Why do you tell so much about those cables? Do you need to sell them? Yes, of course we need to sell them, but there's another reason. Now, one of the things that we found out with a lot of photographers, and we of course now have over, I think over 18, 20 years of experience with tethering. We actually started with that little yellow plug into a CRT TV. The thing that we found out is that a lot of the limitations are... Make yourself even groot. I am big, Annelieke. Okay, sorry. Yeah. One of the big limitations about shooting on location is, of course, that 4.7 meters. Now, normal USB cables are limited to 4.7 meters. Very simple. If you make them longer, you lose connections, it becomes unstable. Now, on location, there's, of course, a lot of debris on the floor. You can have wet surfaces, you can have dust, you can have sand. You don't want it in your cables. So if you don't use 10 meter cables and your laptop is, or your iPad is 1.5 meters high, you always go down 1.5 meters. Now, I'm almost two meters. When I'm holding my camera like this is, let's say, 180. So you always lose about three meters from your 4.7 meter cable. So that means that you only have a circle around your laptop without lifting your cable from the ground of about, let's say, two meters. Let's keep it very, very wide. That's not a lot. If you go further, the cable becomes off the floor, and that means that you get a lot of problems with people walking by, pulling off your laptop, dam damaging your port and whatnot more. By using a 10 meter cable in one piece, you never have to worry about disconnecting. You never have to worry about debris or water getting into the connectors. And you can move around eight meters around your laptop without any problem. Or seven meters, sorry, seven meters around your laptop without any problem. And the cable is still on the floor, so nobody can trip over it. They can only step on it and that's okay. The, the cables are strong enough. Okay, so now we have our camera connected to Yes, cable and we can pay, take pictures but after that what do we do well let's go on a photo shoot yeah are you ready let's go on a photo shoot okay so of course we have our setup for digital classroom and what we do with digital classroom is of course we do that now from home and this is also where i record my music so let me just first show you how our setup here looks 
There we go. And this is going to be important for later on. Let's just take some cool pictures. Oh, too close. There we go. And of course, this is nothing uh, high standing or whatever. I just want to have some fun with you guys. There we go. Let's let's do this. Why not? Uh, let's do. What should we do? Ah, maybe something here. So some some different images. Let's do one from here. Cool. Okay. So now we have all these images in. Let's say that we're, we're now done with our photo shoot. Of course, we have to select images. We have to edit images. Yeah, but how do we do that on an iPad Pro? Do we first get the images of the iPad Pro onto a MacBook? And should we then do all? No. We want to make sure that everything still happens in the iPad Pro. Okay, so I'm going to show you some of the images that I just shot. Because I, of course, shot it without showing you guys. So, the table. I can just swipe through the images I took. So that's one of the things that I like about this cable. I can just literally go through everything that I shot. If you want, of course, you can zoom in. And in all honesty, that's about it. That I'm not going to tell you guys that it's an awesome software package where you can do a lot. It's not. It's very, very simple. It's very basic. And if, by the way, if you do more with stars, etc., this is, by the way, very, very cool. Let me see where it is. Uh, you have tracking locations um, here. You can do a neutral density filter calculation. You can do uh, sharp stars with your focal length, let's say 108, and you're shooting on a full frame. Six seconds is the maximum shutter speed. If I go to, for example, 21, 29 seconds. Now you might wonder, like, 29 seconds of what? 29 seconds to Mars? No. <laughs> I wish. No, 29 seconds means that the Earth, of course, rotates and the stars also, of course, change. Now, if you shoot on a 21 mil on a full frame camera, you are able to shoot it on 29 seconds without star streaks. So in other words, you want to make sure that the stars are sharp. This is something, of course, you can also do in an app on your phone or on an iPad. It's just cool that it's in the software. What I want to point out is this software is super, super simple. It's only I use it only to capture my images. What is the price of the software? It's about 96 euros. And I think that's a lot of money, but it supports your camera shooting wired. I think it's worth every single cent. Okay. And we have, of course, live view, which on my camera doesn't do a lot. And let's go back here. Okay, now the first thing you see, of course, is now it's in here. So how do we get it off? Well, let me explain first some stuff about KISS cable. I think that's the most reasonable thing to do and the most good order. So when we look at KISS cable at the interface, you actually see that I also have an option called tethering. Now let's go there with the mouse. And this is something I'm going to explain too in a moment. And it doesn't work when we're live streaming. Awesome. Thank you, Apple. Okay, doesn't matter. If you look at the whole set, you see the A7R4 on the top, then you see on this iPad and tethering. And you actually see with tethering, you see this little icon where it gives you a connection. Now, normally when you shoot with this cable or other software on the iPad Pro, it will always store the images on a sandbox, so in the software directory. Now, often you can't access that software directory via file browser. This is some of the things that I, a huge frustration of Apple. Please give me one place where I can store all the data and where I can just access it and don't hide it behind. You have to use iTunes. You have to use a computer. No, it's a pro device. I need a good file manager. And there still is no good file manager on the iPad Pro. So what Cascable makes it possible is to create a so-called mirror folder. In my case, I just created a tethering on the File Explorer, uh, sorry, on the Files app. And all my images are now stored in the sandbox, but also on that folder. And that is cool. Another thing that I want to point out is actually here, when you go to settings, you have two options for external monitors. One of the options is to dedicate the external monitor to your images. This is something that I sometimes use in trade shows or demos, where I don't want people to see the whole interface, or I don't want people to see go through a film roll. I just want those images in, but I still find it interesting to see that film roll. If I only want to see the images, I can just mirror. 
by using that dedicated setting, it actually doesn't mirror anymore. So now my iPad Pro has all the photos in a film roll and the external monitor only shows the images. And that is something that's very, very handy. For example, if you're on a sponsored event and people only want you to use the software that is on the trade show, you wouldn't imagine it sometimes really happens that you go like, hey, I'm using Capture One. Yeah, Capture One isn't here. So we prefer if you use Lightroom. Yeah, my camera isn't supported in Lightroom for tethering. Yeah, can you use hot folders? I'm just going like, no. Nowadays, of course, you have smart shooters, so you can shoot tethered into Lightroom. But in the past, that was a real problem. With Cascable, we just solve it. We say, okay, dedicated monitor. You just see the images coming in, and people just wonder, like, why the heck is he shooting on an iPad? Okay, so we have all those images in. And now, what do we do? Well, the first thing I want to do is batch rename those images because I want to make sure that later on I can find them back. Let's first try that in files from Apple. So we go to files, we go to tethering, we see all our images. Let's do select, select all, and let's rename them all. Uh, 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 more. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, that doesn't really work, right? Why, Apple? Why? It's insane. Why can't you batch rename images? Now, you might wonder, let's do it in Lightroom. It doesn't work either. Because Lightroom CC is cloud-based, so it doesn't support batch renaming. It's, it's one of those things. So how do we solve this? Because this is really frustrating. And there's another thing that's really frustrating about files. Over time, it will become huge. Even if you delete everything, it becomes huge. So every once in a while, you have to delete it and install it again. So if you are one of those guys that have an iPad that runs full and you wonder like, how the heck is this possible? I'm not doing anything. Check how much data an app uses. And you will see that files becomes huge over time. It's like a balloon, even if you delete everything. So files, no. Also, when you copy to external hard drives, files can sometimes damage your photos or your videos. So I was looking for something else and I really found something really cool. There's a free version. Hey, I'm Dutch. And of course, there's a paid version. I'm using the paid version because these guys actually gave it to me. So I'm a little bit biased. But in all honesty, they did change a lot of stuff that is great for us photographers. And that's what I love about companies. You have companies that just sell you software and you have companies that listen to the users. And in this case, they listen to what I needed. They implemented it in their software and they gave me the pro version for free for the input. That's awesome. So I'm not supported by them. I just got the software for free. The thing that you do is you start up File Browser Pro. In this case, it's File Browser Pro. Again, there's also a free version. And it does the same thing, just a little bit uh, less. But for what we do, it's more than enough. You create a link. That, that's very easy. I'm not going to show you how to do that, but it's super simple. And here we see tethering. This looks different. So now I have all my files. So let's do select and let's do select all. And now when I go to here, I actually have an option to rename. And this is the stuff that we actually asked them to put in. Like, can you put in name and date, but also the seconds? Because sometimes when you have an image that you shoot 15 frames a second, you want to make sure that they all, of course, have different names and not uh, one, 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 one. And that doesn't look right. So they changed that for us. So let's change this to Digital Classroom DC. And let's just rename 17 files. Confirm. Yes. Oh, isn't that awesome? Finally, you can batch rename files on the iPad Pro for free. And the cool thing is too, I really have to add this to you guys. As you can see here, I also have connected two hard drives and via file browser, first of all, it copies way faster than the Apple's file manager. I don't know if the pro version does it faster than the normal version. And since I'm using this, I didn't have any corrupted files anymore. So that's great because corrupted files, let's be honest, we take photos. We freeze unique moments in time that never come back again. It's such a disappointment when you start using your iPad Pro and then after a year you check your files and like 10% of your files is corrupted and you can throw away. Imagine that being an important picture. So I became very paranoid when using files and I always copied and then every file 
I started checking and at one point I was going like, Frank, why, why do you do this to yourself? Yeah, but I love the iPad Pro, the idea of a pro workflow. And I stopped until I found this software and then I started again. Okay, so now we have everything renamed. Okay, let's go into Lightroom. Okay, let's go for plus. Let's go from files. And then let's go for, of course, on my iPad. And of course, we're gonna go for tethering. There we go. And just select all. And then open. Okay. The cool thing about Lightroom is that at the moment, it's also uploading everything to the cloud. So that means that I now have two options. My first option is very, very simple. I can go to the restroom, I can sit in my couch, I can sit on my bed, I can do whatever I want, and I can use the Apple Pencil or my fingers and start retouching my images. So let's just pick one out. Uh, let's take this one, for example. So I really like that. Uh, let's do a preset. So you can get my preset packs online in our web shop. And we have a lot of different presets there. They're always cool. Oh, I really like this one. Now with presets, I always tell people, don't use the preset as a preset, but always work with the preset. So that's the cool thing. That's also how I designed them. They're a starting point. So in this case, let's give it a little bit more exposure. There we go. Let's change the color slightly towards a slightly more bluish tint. There we go. Color balance? Nah. We don't need color balance, right? Wait a minute, this is a joke. We're gonna talk about it later. Don't stop the video now and go like Frank has gone bananas. You still need color management. Okay, great. So now I have my image. And of course we wanna make sure that I can find my image back. So let's give it five stars. Of course we can also do other images. And the cool thing is what you can do is of course you can just say copy. Oh, sorry. It doesn't work the way that I want it. Copy settings, and you can just select all the other images, and you can just say paste settings if you want to. Okay. Awesome, done. Okay, now you might wonder, Frank, why do you show this image? This is an important image. I now have everything on my iPad. So if I'm on location and I'm, for example, traveling, I can now choose to edit everything on the iPad Pro. There's only one problem. We already talked about colors. Now, the iPad Pro is very, very nice, especially in the designer mode or creator mode. I don't know how they call it. But if I meter it, it no, it doesn't come close to Adobe RGB, but at least it's, it's in balance. So you can do a proper retouch on it. Would I publish images that I retouched on the iPad Pro only? Yes, without any doubt. And I'm gonna tell you why in a moment. Only when I'm shooting stuff that's really important, this is where I cannot live without a calibrated monitor. Now, if you look at the screen, and you can see that in my setup, I'm also using a monitor here, and that's a BenQ monitor. And this is actually the P3 version because I mostly do music here and sometimes I do a little bit of editing. And the P3 version is not 100% Adobe RGB. It's a little bit in between sRGB and Adobe RGB, but it comes very close to Adobe RGB. The nice thing about the P3 monitors is they are very affordable, but they still give you that BenQ quality. So you can calibrate them very nicely and you are just sure that you get a great monitor for photography or video editing. Now, one of the things that I wanna stress with this, if you have a hybrid workflow, and this actually goes for all the workflows, if you choose a monitor, make sure that you choose a monitor that is hardware calibratable. The reason for this is very, very simple to, uh, to explain and also to understand. If you normally calibrate a monitor, you always calibrate that monitor inside the computer with, for example, a color analyzer. Let me show you one. This is, I think, the most sold color analyzer in the world. I don't know for sure, but I know that a lot of people use these, and these are absolutely awesome. This is the Calibrite version. Uh, you can also get them from X-Rite. Um, X-Rite and Calibrite are, in essence, the same company, of course. They just use a different name. 
Uh, and this is um, a workhorse. I, for my professional calibrations for the ISF, I use something similar to this called the C6. Uh, it, it's like a souped-up version, like a like a really souped-up version of this analyzer. Much faster, much more sensitive. But those analyzers are absolutely awesome for uh, doing work on the computer. Let me say, um, let me show you very quickly what the type is. It's the can you see that the display plus color checker display plus. Okay, now when you calibrate your normal computer with an older monitor, you will use software that's on your computer. And that also means that the ICC profile that is built is on the computer. If you use an iPad Pro and you take the cable out and you put it into your iPad Pro, you're not using the profile from the computer for the very simple reason. The computer is not attached and the monitor doesn't know anything about colors. The monitor only shows you, hey, you want me to show something? There we go. If you have a hardware calibrated monitor, it will not be 100% correct. Get me, get me absolutely right. It will not be 100% correct. But at least when you hardware calibrate your monitor and you connect it to an iPad Pro and you choose that setting, it looks way better than just connecting a normal monitor. So I'm always pushing you guys to get hardware calibrated monitors. Now you also know why it's important. Because if you use something that isn't your own computer, your monitor will come close. It will not be professional. It will come very, very close. Okay, so hardware calibrated monitors for our workflow over here. Now in the past and the not so distant past, I'm, I was using touch displays to do our retouching here. And uh, let me show you very quickly what I use. I, I'm, I don't want to disconnect it because, uh, uh, no, I can't do that now, sorry. But I'm using an XP pen here. And that's a pen display, 12 inch, and it looks absolutely great. It works like a charm. And well, you, you get a pen with it, uh, Wacom, Cintiqs, you know, probably uh, Hyundai, I believe, also have some of those tablets, or Hyundai, I don't know how to pronounce it. But XP Pen is the one that we're using at the moment, and, well, even the pens look <laughs> very, very similar to what we will use with Wacom. And they just work like a charm, and they are about, well, a lot cheaper than the Wacoms, and they actually perform about the same. So I can highly recommend XP Pen. The only thing is, I find myself using it less and less. And that has the, the following reason. If I'm editing on the iPad Pro, I can get away with using an Apple Pencil. I can use Photoshop or Affinity Photo, but I prefer Photoshop a little bit more. And I can just edit on the iPad Pro. Now, sometimes you need filters, for example, exposure software or DxO, or maybe you want to do something with portraiture or maybe Luminar or Boris FX, all great software packages, and they don't run on an iPad Pro. But let's say you're on location and the only thing you brought was your MacBook Pro and your iPad Pro. Yes. Did you ever hear about Sidecard? Yes, that's awesome. What Apple has done is absolutely genius. If you have an iPad Pro close to your MacBook, you can literally use your mouse. And I realize now why it didn't work a few minutes ago. You can move your mouse to the side of the screen, push through, and then you can actually operate that mouse and your keyboard on the iPad Pro. You have to make sure that, for example, if you want to copy something from files, you have to have files open. The weird thing is, if you copy from files for your sidecar, they don't correct, corrupt your files. That's weird, right? It's that Apple ecosystem. Anyway, so you can now use AirDrop, or you can just copy it and paste it via sidecar. But sidecar also has another option. And I can't show you that now because we're streaming from that same laptop. But just look it up online. There are many, many videos about it, and it just works like a charm. What you can also do is use Sidecard not as the normal extension, but you can use it in Mirror. And now you have a lot more options. Because now you're mirroring your screen of your MacBook Pro onto your iPad Pro. You feel it coming? You can now start up Photoshop, use the Apple Pencil in Photoshop, even with pressure sensitivity, and do all your extra filtering, retouching, skin retouching, uh, selections, all in the full version of Photoshop running on an iPad Pro with an Apple Pencil. Is it better than, for example, the experience of a Wacom Cintiq or an XP Pen? I almost dare to say yes. There are some slight differences at the moment where I would prefer the XP Pen or Wacom solution. But man, if you already have an iPad Pro and you already have a MacBook, I would literally just go for the iPad Pro and just connect them together, and especially the 12.9 inch. It's absolutely amazing for that kind of stuff. Okay, so 
I can now edit on Photoshop on my iPad Pro with the Apple Pencil. So now I have a full hybrid workflow between, of course, um, the side. Uh, oh, sorry, and we is typing something. Ah, okay, it means Apple Sidecard. Yeah, that's what I mean. So now we have a full workflow where I can do everything on the iPad Pro, or I can make a hybrid workflow where I can work on the iPad Pro and I can work on my Apple Pencil on the uh, sorry on the MacBook Pro. And let me start it over. I can now choose between just working on the iPad Pro or I can make a hybrid workflow thanks to Lightroom where I can work on my images on the MacBook Pro but still use the iPad Pro as my input device. That's actually what I wanted to say. Do I need cables between it? Uh, I found out that when I use a cable, it's all a little bit more stable. But in essence, with Wi-Fi, it works like a charm. But sometimes the moving ends can be a little bit clearer if you use a cable between uh, your MacBook Pro and your iPad Pro. Um, there's also software called AstroPad. Uh, I'm also testing that and it works like a charm. The main thing that you miss, and this is something maybe a hardware manufacturer is listening. I hope they are. Um, the only thing you miss are your hard keys. So for example, Control, Shift, Alt, you really need those in Photoshop. And you can't really get away without them. Try to clone something without, yeah, there you go. Try to add something to a selection without, there you go, you can't do it. Change the color with the X. Yes, you can do that, of course, in Photoshop by just clicking the colors. So a lot of the options you can do with your Apple Pencil or with your mouse or with your fingers. But there are a lot of options where you need those shortcuts. I always thought like maybe if you have eight buttons, that will be fine. Now, the cool thing about AstroPad and the Apple solution is that you can choose for a hovering keyboard. The hovering keyboard, you can program for which keys you want to do. And you can also change the brush size and everything. It looks a little bit like what XP Pen is doing on the site or what Wacom is doing with the AK remote. Does it work fine? Yes and no. That was the only thing where I was doubting between the XP Pen or Wacom and the iPad Pro. I really need hard keys to make it a fast and efficient workflow. What we have now is the keys are, of course, on the side and it works, but I still have to look with my eyes, which key am I pressing? So in essence, it works. It's just a little bit slower. Is that important? It just depends on how much you do. I think it's negligence. It doesn't really bother me, but it is something I would love to have an external device, like, for example, the AK remote from Wacom, make it work with an iPad Pro and, of course, with the MacBook Pro, so you can use it on both. Uh, I tested Tourbox, which is absolutely awesome, but that only works on the MacBook Pro, so not on the iPad Pro. So when you're working in Photoshop, of course, you can use the, um, uh, the Tourbox, of course, or all the other solutions. But if you use the iPad Pro in standalone mode, those options don't work anymore. And I would just love one device that I can use on the iPad Pro and on the computer. I'm even willing to connect it with a cable. Okay, so... The hybrid workflow, the standard workflow. And there's actually nothing more to say. That is how it works. Now, if you want to go into Photoshop, for example, let's say you want to do something in Photoshop, it's still no problem. You can go, for example, let's take this image. And you can do whatever you want. You can do a slideshow, you can organize it, you can share it. You can edit it in Photoshop, you can export it to Camera Roll, you can share to Discover. Let's edit it in Photoshop for now. Of course, that takes a little bit of time. What's new? Yes. Do we really need to see what's new? Yes, because there's a lot of new stuff in Photoshop. If you don't know it yet, there's been an update for Lightroom a few days ago, and it's absolutely amazing. I don't know what's going on here. There we go. Okay, so now I'm in Photoshop on the iPad Pro. So now I can do whatever I want. I don't even know what I want to do. So let's just destroy my own image. Let's make it a little bit bigger so you guys can see. There we go. And of course, you can send it to Lightroom. The nice thing is everything is now updated into the cloud. So... As soon as you open up Lightroom on your uh, desktop, it, all the images will be there. Is it all perfect? 
no, not really, in all honesty. Um, there's a lot of stuff that still is a little bit worrisome. Like, for example, I would love to be able to edit in Adobe RGB. And whatever I try with Lightroom CC, it always exports in ProPhoto RGB. I don't want to use ProPhoto RGB. I want to use Adobe RGB. Um, I think that's about the only thing that I really don't like. So in the end, um, for me, Lightroom Classic is still where all my images live. So I have this little folder created where I see everything coming in from Lightroom CC and I can just copy it into the catalog from Lightroom Classic. If you want to see that, I can also make a video about that, of course. Um, the thing is, however, that at that point, I still have to make that conversion from ProPhoto RGB to Adobe RGB or you do it in Photoshop, but it's one extra step. I would love for Adobe to just make it in the settings. How do you want to export? 16 bits TIFF? Fine. Adobe RGB or sRGB, fine, but don't make it fixed. So that's the only thing I'm running now into at the mobile workflow where I'm going like, that's one step that I have to do extra that shouldn't be there. And especially when it's aimed at consumers, why not make it sRGB instead of pro photo RGB, which is something that hardly anybody can use because the monitors don't show it, printers don't really print it. It's a real 16 bits workspace. So if by accident you go to eight bits, you destroy your image. I don't know why they do it, but hey, there should be good reason, right? Okay, let's take a look at this, because now we're going to talk a little bit more about hardware. Does this look right? <laughs> no, right? This looks absolutely terrible. Let's fix that. Let's go. Let's go for color. Let's go for the picker. And let's pick color balance. There we go. Looks worse. Looks worse. Looks even worse. Oh my. No, 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 no. Maybe here. Okay, let's change that a little bit myself. There we go. Yeah, it looks pretty okay. Yeah, perfect. Professional eyes, right? Now, um, that's not how you set color balance. Now, color balance is incredibly important. Let me show you um, my full screen camera for now. There we go. Okay, so a color balance is very important. First thing we have to know what color balance is. So color balance is the balance between the colors RGB. Those are our primary colors, red, green, and blue. If you look at our monitor, it only shows you RGB. When we look at printers, they actually use the primary colors, not but the secondary colors. They use cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. And black is actually key. Now, why isn't black black, but black is key? If you change the luminance of a color, so the brightness of a color, the color will become, for our eyes, more saturated. This means that if you shoot on location and you think you have everything set up correctly and you make the colors correct and then you change the exposure, you will impact those colors. And now comes the really, really tricky part, what a lot of people don't understand. Everything is connected like wires and those wires have to be on tension. So maybe I can show this in Photoshop one moment. Maybe that would be cool to draw it out. Uh, let's start up Photoshop. Let's do a lure. Yeah, no, I'm not showing anything, but and let me switch over to split screen now so you guys can see. OK, cool. Uh, let me take a brush with white paint. OK, yep. Okay, let me a little bit sharper and a little bit smaller. OK, there we go. Uh, is it one moment. I want to do it right for you guys. There we go. Green. One moment. I have to do it in mirror. Sorry, guys. Okay. Green, red, and blue. And in the middle, there's a D65. Okay, um, this is the triangle of colors. Green on top, because we are most sensitive for green. Red on the right, because it's on the right, no, because we're very sensitive for red too, and it's an emotional color. And blue all the way on the bottom. I don't know exactly, but I believe it's 66% green that we see 22% red and 11% blue, with slight variations also depending on your eyes. Now, when Kelvin invented the color balance or the color temperature, actually, he threw a black piece of material into the fire and he saw it going from red, warm, all the way to white, very, very hot. 
all the way to blue. Incredibly hot. And he actually said, okay, let's do warm 2800 degrees Kelvin. Let's do in the middle 5500 degrees Kelvin. And let's do all the way on top to 9200 degrees Kelvin. You see those settings also on your monitor. For example, if you put it on a low Kelvin setting, you will see that the whites become really reddish. If you put it in the middle, you see that the whites are a little bit reddish, and that's correct. Whites should be a little bit reddish. If you go all the way to the top, you will see that white looks incredibly white, but not blue. How is that possible? When you do the wash, what do you do? You throw in blue caps, right, to make white whiter. Because we only see so little blue, it doesn't really point out to us, hey, that white is blue. No, that white actually looks, looks pristine white. Don't be fooled by that. It's not the correct white. You need for that reddish blue. That's why we use that color analyzer, right, to calibrate the monitor. Now, that D6500 point is very important because if we draw lines from red through that point, we actually come out at cyan. From blue through that point, we actually come out at yellow. And from green, oh, through that, ah, you know what I mean, right? Let's go. For green to that point, we actually come out at magenta. And those lines have to be 100% strong. So in other words, they can't switch or flex. If you change the exposure of one color, the idea is that mathematical, all the colors contract or expand or shift or turn or do this. If you don't calibrate and you do it by eye, it might look great for one image. That's the problem. For one image, it looks fine, but now you tilt it towards another image and the color space tilts and now everything that's red is way too red or too magenta. Everything that's blue is a little bit towards cyan. So you have to make sure that that base is correct. So for the monitor, we do an ICC profile with a color analyzer. What do we do for the camera? We have two solutions, which works great. The first one, and this is brand new, this is the X-Rite or Calibrite Color Checker Passport Duo. And they finally listened to me. Look at this. Now you can find it in a dark studio. But why not on that side? But hey, we are getting there. Now, the Duo is awesome because the Duo has a photography part, including the white balance card. This is the one you use to create a profile. This is for white balance. In all honesty, I only use this and I do white balance on one of those. If you open it up, that's why it's called the Duo. This saves you a lot of money if you're also into video. You also have the video part. So you have the video checker and of course the white, middle and black to set up your white and black points correctly for video. This isn't cheap. This is 240 euros, I believe. Let me switch back to full screen, by the way, that you guys can see better. Okay. The other solution is also from uh, Calibrite, and this is the one I've been using for years and promoting for years. This is the normal white balance part. If you close it, you have the color checker part. Now, I never use this part. I always use the top part. This part is more for the creative part, and I always think that creative part should be in presets and not in changing the color balance. It should be in a preset. So always use the top part. That's the one that creates the profile. To give you an idea, this one is only for photography. You can use it a little bit for video. And this one is, I believe, 140 euros. The other one is 240 euros. So that saves you a lot of money if you buy both video and photography. Also remember that every few years you have to replace them. So be careful that you don't put them out in the bright sun open because then you have to replace them after 10 minutes. Probably. <laughs> These are precision instruments. A lot of people don't realize this. They think it's just a color checker. This is a precision instrument. If there's just a little bit off, there you go again. That balance is skewed. Your colors won't look right. But this is a color checker. Is there an easier solution for people that, for example, also do landscapes or that just don't want to use a color checker? Frank, creating a profile later. I just want proper color balance. Oh, yes, we have the perfect solution for you. A lot of photographers worldwide already know, and they use this. You didn't see me using it yet, but we're going to make some videos about it, because since March, we are the distributor for Rogue. 
And the reason I'm not using this a lot is because this is more aimed at the outside work. It's more aimed at uh, professional photographers doing outside work that has to be 100% color accurate. Now, of course, you have your auto white balance in camera, right? You take a picture, the camera determines the white balance. But how often are you 100% satisfied with that? For me, most of the times. But I always change it just a little bit because it's just not 100% correct. And there you go again. Green may look right. Blues look terrible. Change the color balance and it's great. This device does it for you and more. So this is the so-called Expo Disc. Now, you don't need to buy it for your lens. We have two versions. We have the 77 centimeter, uh, uh, millimeters and 82. My advice would actually be to buy the 82 because you don't screw it on your lens. What you do is you hold it in front of your lens and you set your camera on custom white balance. The only thing you have to do is make one picture with this. The white balance is set and you're done. You can take pictures. And the cool thing is you don't have to correct anything later in Photoshop because it's using that custom white balance. Now I told you guys it can do more. Yes. Don't you think it's annoying to have dust on your sensor? Yes. Same here. Use a Expo disc, shoot it on F22, and you see all the dust spots on your sensor because you are photographing an 18% gray backdrop, right? Now make that into blue. Create a mask in Photoshop with those uh, dust uh, particles and you can create something that you can get all your dust out of your images in a batch by using the Expo Disc. Isn't that awesome? And um, well, you can, s you can buy them on our web shop or in any store that sells Rogue. They're sold worldwide also on Amazon. But the Expo Disc, I think, especially when you do a lot of outside work on location, this is very, very vital if you don't want to use a color checker. And again, this one you don't have to replace. The color checker you do have to replace every once in a while. In all honesty, this one only does white balance. The color checker, of course, also creates a profile. So if you want to do it 100% correct, the color checker. If you want to do it very, very correct and more than enough, the Expo Disc. Okay, so that's that. Uh, so we did the color balance, we did our profiling, we did the calibration of the monitor, we did the iPad, we did the hybrid workflow, we did the side card, but there's still more. Frank, when we're on location, one of the most asked questions, aren't you afraid that your iPad falls down on the floor? No, not really. And why not? Well, every time we do a workshop on location, I'm used to bring my laptop. And my laptop we had on a table with a nice bend over it. And somehow, every time when you change location, you have to take the bend off, close the laptop, pick the laptop up, put it in the bag, take the stand with the bend, of course, don't lose the bend, <laughs> walk to a new location, put the stand down, put the laptop up, open up the laptop, boot up, there we go, put the bend on, connect the cable, and you can shoot. Doesn't sound like a lot of work, unless you're walking around a lot and you change locations a lot. Watch this. For the iPad Pro, we're actually using this from Ulanzi. I'm not affiliated to them. I just know the distributor. And I have to be in all honesty, they gave me one to test out. And I never gave it back. Don't tell them. It's still here. So this is the Ulanzi. And this is an iPad holder. And they're very, very cheap. They're about 39 euros. Don't pay more. It's, it's a waste of money if you pay more. These are about 39 euros. And the cool thing about this one is you can open it up like any other. So you can just do this. But you all know when you have your iPad in and you close it and you do this, it still doesn't sit tight. So you open it up, you press it down on your iPad. You... Still not tight. Oh, crap. Still not tight. And before you know it, it's too tight and you break your glass or your iPad is curving. Not nice. The nice thing about Ulanzi is that on the top there's this really small dial. And look at how easy and how f how much you must turn to just turn a millimeter. So by using this soft material, I always do this. I first put my iPad in, I click it down, I lock it, and then a few turns, maybe two or three, and you really feel that it sits down. We, we tried it with the stand doing like this, didn't fall off. Now, don't do that. I don't advise you guys doing that because it can fall off, of course. But this is very, very secure for 39 euros. Now, you also see something on the bottom. And we call uh, call this a ball head. 
I have it on my uh, iPad for the very simple reason. If you're outside and you are in bright sun and your iPad is like this, sometimes you get the sun in by using a ball head and by, uh, let me see, by opening that a little bit, you can literally just move your iPad in any direction you want. And those ball heads are, and a week knows exactly the prices. This is a Frio. I think they're about 10 or 15 or maybe 20 euros. So in all, maybe 50 euros, you're done with selecting or uh, connecting your iPad and it's very, very secure. So you don't have to worry that it falls down. Okay. Um, okay, another question that came in about the cables from uh, IQ Wire. Frank, I see that you're using the USB-C. Is the cable also available in other sorts? Well, when you look at competitors, you can see that they have a lot of different cables. Micro USB, USB-C, uh, USB mic uh, Mini, uh, USB 3.1, uh, USB-A. There, there are a lot of different options. Now, I already told you guys that we have boosters in our cables. And we only have actually two different cables with boosters. We also have cables with micro USBs, but they don't have boosters. The second cable we have with boosters is this one. So we do have more than USB-C. This is a USB 3. So for example, for Nikon, let me put my hand behind it, not in front, of course. That's the USB 3. So big one. Also 10 meters. And now comes the fun part. At the start, I explained to you guys that with IQ Wire, we have something called IntelliConnect. And that means that we have boosters and IntelliConnect. And that makes a very, very stable, but most of all, a very nice connection where we also have power going up and down the cable. So that means that we can charge our camera during the photos, but also that we have a very stable, but also very strong connection. And that means that we actually have pigtails. So the biggest frustration is that you have to buy several cables for different cameras. So let's say you're working with your friend in a studio, you have a USB-C camera, he has a USB-B camera. That's a problem. You only have one cable, so you have to buy two. And those cables aren't cheap. With our solution, you don't need to buy two cables. You just need some pigtails. So for example, this is a pigtail to USB micro, mini, mini B. And this is one, and you recognize it. This one actually goes to mini USB. I don't think they come very well over on the TV, uh, on YouTube, sorry. And USB A, also bright red. We love red. Okay, so the pigtails, they have something really cool because normally, of course, you have a USB-C cable. So you have a female. No, you have a male. No, female. No, male. But how do you connect that cable? In normal solutions, you need something called a conversion or a gender changer. With tethering, we don't want a lot of stuff on our cables. We want that connection to be as straight as possible, as cool as possible, as less interference as possible. So that's why we actually search out for cables and they're pretty hard to find if you also want them in quality. And let me just open this up because this is really nice to show you guys. I have to be honest, not all cables work. So make sure if you need a pigtail, you order them from uh, from us or email us because we know which ones work. And what we have is we don't have male connectors, but we actually have pigtails with female USB-C and then on the other side the cable. Now, the nice thing is if you look at your camera, some people are really afraid that there's this one connector and there's no breaking point for the very simple reason if you stand on your cable, your camera can drop down. This is why I'm using an elastic or flexible armrest. So if somebody steps on my camera and it would fall down, it's still connected to my arm. But most of the time you will feel it. It, it never happened. But some people, they really are frantic about that. In that case, we designed them or we ordered them long enough that you can put them in here. I can't show you now. You go through our cable block and you end up exactly on the other side, under your cam camera, exactly on the side of the cable block, and you just plug in the cable on that side. So the pigtails give you an extra breaking point if you want it. You can also keep it all on that side and secure it fastly, but they're long enough to give you that extra breaking point. And they're available in micro USB, mini USB, USB 3, and even USB-C. So you can even go from female USB-C to male USB-C if you want that breaking point in your cable. 
Now I'm shooting Terret for more than 15 years and in all honesty I never had my cable one time, sorry. I have one time that somebody janked the camera out of my hands. Yeah, that was a big problem. <laughs> Ever since then I'm using that uh, brace, uh, that uh, arm uh, thing and actually after that it all went fine. Okay, so I think we now discussed everything that I wanted to discuss. Uh, let me see if there are any questions in the chat. And I didn't expect any questions, to be honest, uh, because I tried to do it very, um, yeah, very, how do you call it? Very uh, complete. You know what I mean, right? Very complete in what I wanted to say. Okay, let's um, see if we can do something else about color management. Yeah. Okay, let me switch over to uh, my uh, unit, uh, my uh, uh, iPad again. Sorry, I'm doing everything today. Normally, people are switching for me. Um, okay. One of the things that a lot of people don't understand is how color management actually works. Now, I don't have my Apple Pencil here. Anna Week! Anna Week! Can you get me my Apple Pencil uh, quickly? Okay, and a week is getting my Apple Pencil. In the meantime, I'm going to show you something that I think is very important. And if you like, please subscribe there. There we go. And the Apple Pencil is on its way. Hey guys, and welcome to our studio in Amaloid. My name is Frank Doroff, and today I want to talk to you guys about something that we get a lot of questions about. Hey Frank, how do you like this image? Hey Frank, what can I improve in this image? And of course, I love to help you guys out. But online, I mostly am limited to just saying, hey, I really like it, or continue like this, or change this. I, I can only do short images because, let's be honest, we get so many questions. So that's what actually got us thinking. And we started a Patreon. Now, what is a Patreon? Well, let me put it this way. Do you want an extensive photo critique every month? Do you want the bed phone where you can directly contact me with any questions you have? Do you want to be a member of a group that's closed off on Facebook that have the same interest as you guys? That isn't about putting people down, but it's actually about helping people progress in their photography and retouching. Well, that's our Patreon. Now, by joining our Patreon, every month you can deliver one or two images. We're not that strict about it. And I will do a whole video. In that video, I will show you how I would do the retouching what I would change about the shot, and I give you a whole lot of tips. That video is put online on a closed-off website, and it means that only the guys from Patreon can see that video and help you out. So I help you out, and the whole community helps you out. It's just an awesome way to learn. So, if you like what we do, of course, the first thing you can do is subscribe to our channels, leave comments, and smash that like button because we really like it and tell other people about it. But if you want to do a little bit more and help us out creating the awesome programs you enjoy, like Behind the Closed Doors, Digital Classroom, quite frankly, our upcoming podcast, Beyond Photography with the Doorhoffs, and a lot more, then please join our Patreon. I already know you're absolutely going to love it. So head on over to the link below and start joining our awesome group on Patreon and get a lot of benefits. Thank you so very much for supporting our work. See you online. Okay, now I'm not gonna lie to you guys. Patreon or if you buy something from our store is of course incredibly important. Just like most of you guys, we are struggling to keep everything open and working because the gas prices over here are insane. We actually have to cancel workshops for the very simple reason one day 500 euros to heat our building which is let's be honest it's just insane and we can't afford that at the moment so yeah if you join patreon or anything we give away a lot of stuff for free and it would be nice if you guys join patreon and even on patreon you get your money's worth because we're doing a lot of reviews there we're doing portfolio reviews we are 24 7 available for questions of course not 24 7 but sometimes we even answer questions in the middle of the night and you support our work a lot so if you want to join patreon please do it really helps us out in these hard times and i would never ever ask you guys for that but in this case this is very very extreme situations of course and for everybody so i understand if you can't do it but if you can please join our patreon or buy something from our website or whatever if you like what we do okay so about color management you probably heard about double color management 
And double column management means that you do something wrong. <laughs> Obvious, right? Okay, let me just show you how column management works. So I'm gonna do that on the iPad Pro. I have to improvise a little bit. So the first thing you do is, pick it up, let's see if that works. One moment. Of course we don't need the camera anymore. So let's disconnect the camera for now. I think it's this is gonna work. And otherwise I have to reconnect it, okay. First of all, of course, we have our camera. And the camera, we use the color checker. The color checker makes a DCP or ICC profile. And that's for your camera. So the DCP profile is from Adobe. The ICC profile is actually that works in almost everything. So it works in Capture One, it works in Bridge, it works in Lightroom, it works everywhere. DCP is from Adobe. That's the camera. You select your camera only in Lightroom or any other raw converter. Capture One, Lightroom. That's it. You don't choose it anywhere else. From Lightroom, you go into your software and this is where you have Adobe RGB or sRGB, I don't care, whatever color space you do, but you first use the color checker passport or any other device. You create a profile and that profile you use to go into your color space. So again, you have your raw file. The first thing you do is you go into Photoshop Lightroom, not in Photoshop, Photoshop Lightroom, so Lightroom, sorry. <laughs> you go into Lightroom, you select the preset that you created, the, the follow the instructions online, it's very easy. That you connect to your camera file and after that, then you go to your pre-designed color space. You probably already know why. The color space has a predetermined set of coordinates. Every color, again, has an X, a Y, and a Y coordinate, so always three coordinates. Those three coordinates are fixed in a color space. So if you don't calibrate your monitor, or sorry, your camera with a color checker, you are, of course, opening it in Adobe RGB, but all the colors of your camera are just scattered around in that color space. It doesn't still fit on that location. If you create a preset with a color checker, now everything is in balance. Remember those lines that has to be tight? Those lines are now tight. Maybe they're not Adobe RGB, maybe one color is Pro Photo RGB, one color is sRGB. But by using that profile, now everything is connected. So now when you convert it to sRGB or Adobe RGB, it, mathematically, it will all fit together. So now you have a proper base. That's all you do with the color checker, nothing more. It's for the camera. Now, of course, we also have a monitor. The monitor we use the color analyzer for. So let's call that a three stimulus meter. Yeah. So that's, for example, your color checker uh, display plus. So let's do that. The display plus. That creates again an ICC profile. And that's for your monitor. But it's actually not. It's actually for your operating system. Unless you do a hardware calibrated monitor. Then we go back. And then it's for your OS plus your monitor. This is why I love hardware calibrated monitors because one, they have way more bit depth, so it looks smoother. And two, it's not operating system dependent. Of course, it's always better to use an operating system where it's calibrated to that operating system, but at least you have something in the middle. Now, that monitor profile you set up in your operating system and then you forget about it. After three weeks, you do it again, forget about it. You don't use that profile anywhere else no don't do it why do i stress this so much because now comes the problem we're going to open up photoshop and photoshop if you look at your color spaces or for example if you go from lightroom to photoshop it always asks you unless you're using cc of course because then it's pro photo it always asks you from classic what color space and what bit depth or what setting well for me it's always tiff 16 bits adobe rgb don't ever put there in the color checker don't ever put there in your monitor profile so when you open up photoshop there's only one option 
16 bits or 8 bits. I would never use 8 bits. And your color space. And these are the color spaces that are already determined. These color spaces you can't change. These are determined by Adobe and by everybody that uses them. You can't touch those spaces. And that's it. Nothing more. Close the door. Now you're working in an Adobe RGB color space. And I think this is something that a lot of people don't get about calibrating. They think, I calibrate my camera. And let's call my camera profile Frank 1. So now when I open up Photoshop, I have to edit, of course, in Frank 1. And my monitor, of course, I want to see my Frank 1. Now, you have to realize that everything is determined by our color spaces. That's why we buy an Adobe RGB color monitor, right? We want to be as close as possible to Adobe RGB. So the first thing we do is we calibrate our monitor to be as close to RGB as Adobe RGB as possible. Then, of course, we take pictures and we want to make sure that if we scale those pictures up or down to an Adobe RGB color space, we want to make sure that all the colors are in the right place, right? So if red is multiplied by 10 and green is multiplied by 4, we have to make sure that if we make it all half, that it doesn't go half for both. No, it goes half in the correct way. And that can mean that green comes out higher than red because it's, it's a curve. Let me put it this way, not to make it too complicated. So you have to make sure that everything is correct. By making that profile with your color checker passport, you are making sure that you come as close as possible to that profile. When you export from Lightroom to Photoshop, you are already determining the color space you're working in, Adobe RGB. The monitor is already calibrated. The camera is now calibrated, so everything should fit nicely together. And now when you're in the monitor and you have to transport, for example, from Adobe RGB to sRGB, it just calculates it perfect, perfectly and it works. Of course, you can set some settings like, uh, for example, how you want your black point to be treated. Just try it out, read the descriptions and just find what fits for your workspace. Okay, so color management, in essence, it's very difficult for a lot of people. But if you think about it like this, it's incredibly simple. You just make sure that everything comes as close as possible to that Adobe RGB color space or sRGB, whatever you want to use. Now, that third thing, that's very important. That why, that big why. Why is that so important? I just see that Photoshop doesn't zoom in. That's weird. Huh, maybe because it's a second monitor. I also don't see my uh, toolbar. Bar. Interesting. So why is that big Y so important? This is where the final part comes in in shooting. And you guys have seen me shooting with it a lot. A light meter. Yep, there we go. Don't disconnect your connection at the moment. <laughs> because I'm going to explain to you why. So when we take a picture, we have to make sure that the white balance is correct. We do that with the color checker or with the expo disk. But... Everything is connected also with that big Y, luminance. So if, for example, you shoot something with a color checker or the expo disk, you set up your white balance correctly, that's okay. But if you start using the color space, what only the color checker does, now it becomes important that all three coordinates are right. If you don't use a color checker and you're underexposed by a full stop and you create that whole profile, you're pretty much okay. But if you start adding stuff and changing stuff later on, the more and more you start to deviate from that setting. Sometimes it's very creative and it looks nice and you can create a preset out of it, which you can never replicate after that. But hey, you know, but most of the time we don't want this. We want something where you can blindly on a black and white monitor can just select your color profile and you just know it's going to be right. The only way to do this is use a light meter when you shoot to make sure that your exposure is right use a color checker or expo disk on location for color balance and for CMS, so color management system, so color space. Calibrate your monitor so you're as close as possible to the colors. And then, of course, open up in Photoshop in the color space you want to work. So never mix those together. Frank, how about printers? Yes, printers. Printers are awesome, but printers are very, very difficult to calibrate. You need a spectrometer that actually also emits light on your printer subject. So we have a studio set up for that and we actually have a spectrometer that actually meters what we put on ink. 
So in other words, we put in paper, we print a test pattern, we hold it under the spectrometer, it meters everything, and then it gives you the profile for that paper and that ink. Again, if you underexpose your photo, it will give you not the great results that you want. So always make sure that you get it right. The reason I'm not really diving into the printer part is for a lot of people, calibrating your printer is way too expensive and way too much work. It really takes a lot of work. What you can better do is if you buy an Epson, buy Epson, for example, premium luster paper. I absolutely love that paper. Use the original Epson inks and just download the profile from their website. The website profiles are great. They are very, very accurate and you can still use them on that paper. If you change for, for example, Hannemuller paper, just look on their website and download the profile for the printer you are using. And that becomes a huge problem because sometimes you see a profile for that paper, but for which ink? Because if I use Epson ink, I will get a different look from Canon ink, or I will get a different look from a third party ink. So I'm a very big proponent from just getting the right paper from the manufacturer of your printer and just use that profile for those colors. Okay, any questions? No questions? So I think we did everything. Let me uh, go back to the iPad and let's just uh, recap. So you guys literally see what we've done and makes it a little bit easier to remember. One moment. Yeah, let me do it like this. I feel like a total noob. Oh, one moment. I already see what's going on. Let me see if you can now see the sides. If I go back, no. Oh, something I have to. Oh. Sorry, guys, microphone. There we go. Okay, so recap. We need on location, we need the iPad Pro. It's one of those days. So we need the iPad Pro. That's our main thing. We connect it to a holder and a stand. And I would prefer a ball head. Just squeeze some letters in between. Cables. Uh, I'm using IQ Wire. And I highly recommend you guys using that too, especially the 10 meter versions. And you can use pigtails if you want. And that's the cool thing. It's one cable that you can use for all your cameras. And that's a big plus for me because you only have to spend your money once. Do make sure that you uh, secure your connection. For example, our cable block is great for that. And it's very affordable compared to the competition which is about 100 euros and we sell them for 35 hey good deal right okay so when you have that you're done so on location we're finally there for the software cast cable and then you need the full version which is about 86 euros they have a version for five euros where you can test out if your camera works in all honesty i think that's bs I think they should just give you a five day testing period and after that just close the software down because I actually bought it twice for five euros to test it out if it worked with my camera. It didn't work, so I lost 10 euros. That's not a lot of money, but it's still a lot of money if you lose it in five seconds because it didn't work. Now, of course, you could have said like, read the list. Yeah, the list is hard to find on their website and it isn't 100% conclusive and they even said try it out, so yeah. Nowadays it works for the uh, Sony A7R4. So if you have an A7R5, please make sure you check it out or pay the five euros to test it out. Probably in the future they will support it. Um, okay, so we have Cast Cable. After that you have the hybrid workflow where you use actually Lightroom 
Azure Hub. So Lightroom goes to the laptop and desktop and to the iPad. And whatever you want, you can just combine it. If you want to work on your iPad for a minute, you work on your iPad. If you want to work on your laptop for a minute, you work on your laptop. That's what I love about this workflow. I'm not limited anymore. I can even use it on my phone. Sometimes, literally, guys, if I did a workshop and I'm tired, I just download everything on the iPad Pro. I put the iPad Pro away. I get my phone. And when I'm in bed at night, I would just go to the images, half sleeping and going like, oh, five stars, five stars, five stars. And the next day I open up my uh, iPad and I already see all my stars. On the iPad Pro, I normally do my pre-retouch, like the cropping, a little bit maybe shadows or highlights, taking some small stuff out. And then when I'm done with that, I'm opening everything up in Photoshop for the filtering. And then I save everything again on the iPad. We can do that with a hardware calibrated monitor or without. Preferable if you need it very, very good, use the hardware calibrated monitor. Okay, so for that we need a hardware calibrated. My writing is very, very bad. Sorry, guys, I'm mostly type. Hardware calibrated, my personal favorites, of course, BenQ. You get what you pay for, right? Uh, and, and in the case of BenQ, you get way more than what you pay for. And you can only spend your money once. So I think they create great monitors. Okay, so this is for the hybrid. So the BenQ actually only works on the laptop and a little bit on the iPad. You can also use it on the iPad. And now Sidecar. Or Astropod. Those two solutions make it possible to literally work on your iPad Pro as if it's a drawing tablet. It has some disadvantages and it has a lot of advantages. The disadvantages is those hotkeys and the brush size uh, changer, which is of course way better on an uh, XP pen or Wacom. But the main advantage is of course you can work wherever you want and you don't need extra money. It's already inside that Apple ecosystem. And in all honesty, one of the reasons for me to go back to Apple was this. I left Apple many years ago for a very simple reason. They took everything out of the laptops that I loved. The keyboard became very bad. They took out a card reader. What the heck? They took out HDMI. Are you crazy? They took out um, a MagSafe. Insane. And all that other stuff all came back in the M1 laptops. The first M1 we sent back within a day because it didn't work right. I'm now using the M1 Pro. Uh, and guys it's an insane laptop and it's very affordable combine it with an apple air uh, ipad air or ipad pro and you're in heaven for photography especially the ones with the oled displays i believe that's only the pro that works fine did i forget anything so you have the holder you have the iq wire cable secure for the cable block of course you have the ulanci this so also for uh, ulanci holder and of course a stand uh, then you have Cascable, the software, hybrid. Oh, of course, um, for the software, we also need a file browser. And that's for batch renaming. So, And then, of course, Lightroom as a hub, hardware calibrated. Okay, Sidecar and Astropad. I think that's it. Okay. Um... Let me see if there are any questions. Guys, if you are on YouTube and you have any questions, let me know. Because otherwise I'm going to end it slowly. Okay, we don't see any questions anymore. Okay, so that's great. Um, for the, um, um, the stuff like IQ Wire, I would highly recommend you guys go for Studio FD. Uh, that's our Dutch site. And we also, of course, have frankdorf.com where the shop is actually located. But if you go to Studio FD, you can find all the information about the Rogue products, including the umbrellas. And that's really good news. We got the snoots in for the magnetic system. I almost forgot to tell you guys. On speed lights, because on location, we also often use speed lights. And we have the whole magnetic system now, including the snoots on stock. So make sure you check that out. And even if you don't want to use the rest, the snoot for speed lights... It's amazing. It's one of the main reasons to use the magnetic system for a lot of people that want to draw attention to something. And of course, the gel holder, the omnidirectional, the, the, the grids. It's just an awesome system. And of course, the flash benders we have too, and the Expo Disc. Um, IQ Wire is also found on the website, so you can also check that out. And our ClickPro backdrops is also on the website. 
Um, if you want to go straight to the shop, just go to the direct link. Uh, that's also where you can find the preset packs. I show you already a little bit of the presets. I believe the presets are sold for 10 or 15 euros. That's a proper price for a preset pack. I don't believe in 199 euros for a preset pack. It's not like magic. It's something you can do yourself. It takes a lot of time, but you can do yourself. For 10, 15 euros, you have the perfect starting point. It goes fast. The presets are pretty cool. I use them myself. So it's not something that I create and use something else myself. Those are the presets I use. So it's a great starting point. And for 15 euros or 10 euros, come on. Um, I think that's about it. Yes. And of course, our main website. If you didn't already, subscribe to our channel. Leave comments below. Smash that like button because we really like that. And also follow our shorts. So we started the series with shorts. We try to do at least four a week where we show you a little bit behind the scenes information. And of course, give you tips. Now, one minute is very, very short. That's why it's called shorts. And I'm frustrated as heck that I have to shoot like this because I think this is insane. I always am a little bit... I'm waiting for the first day that somebody comes up to me and goes like, Sir, excuse me, if you do video, you should do it like this. And then I have to tell him I'm a professional photographer and I know. Yeah. So maybe shorts. I hope one day we are able to use shorts the way that it's supposed to be. Short videos, but 16 by 9 and not 9 by 16. This is not how you are supposed to take video. I'm sorry. But we are still doing the shorts. And in all honesty... I have to add this. It is fun because it forces you to do a totally different way of compos composing, a totally different way of telling your story. So in essence, shooting vertical is challenging, but I run into so many problems when I want to show you guys something and I'd have to do this. I have to scan because I just can't fit it into the picture. So follow our shorts. I think they're pretty funny. And the cool thing is also that Anna Week and our intern Nika are also doing shorts. So Anna Week already has one online, but you're going to see them more and more in the shorts. So make sure you follow those two. Okay, um, no more questions. So that means that I'm now going to take a little bit of time off. And um, you're going to see the shorts uh, shortly. <laughs> Thank you so very much for watching, guys. And make sure you check out our Patreon site, of course which is absolutely awesome. And uh, I hope for the mobile workflow, you are a little bit wiser. We are still uh, fine tweaking everything, but I think we're, we call it the mobile workflow 2.0, which we are now, I think we're pretty close to nailing it, uh, but it took a lot of work. And I hope with this episode, I can take that work a little bit out of your hands and actually create something that you guys can use and directly use in your iPad Pros. Most of all, don't use the file manager from Apple use file browser or file browser pro because that will save you a lot of corrupt files thank you so very much for watching guys and see you again next time bye bye